All there right. We go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hashtag Open Ed. I'm Miley from the Hashtag Open team. If you're not familiar with us, Hashtag Open is a dating app that was created by and for people who find traditional dating platforms just a little bit limiting. So if you're somebody who's looking to really identify yourself more authentically, maybe you're looking to date with a significant other, or you're just looking for some new dating experiences, Hashtag Open is going to really offer you dating updated. So what that means is when you join our community, you're going to find a lot of open-minded users. Actually, we have 97% of our users that as already being in or interested in exploring consensual non-monogamy. We also have a lot of members that identify as queer, trans, non-binary, or maybe they're exploring their sexuality. We're also a place where you can explore kinks. So if that sounds interesting to you, we will give you all the abilities to identify yourself. We have an extensive list of labels to choose from. And if you don't see something that fits you, you can go ahead and type in something that um, really fits the true you. If you're somebody that's exploring with your significant other, in addition to creating a solo account, you can create a partner account, which will allow you to swipe, match, and chat with other users, um, either individually or with your partner. We also give you the ability to um, go ahead and indicate all of your preferences, interests, and boundaries right on your profile clearly. And that makes it easier for other users to find you based on those shared interests like kinks, um, maybe date experiences, or just kind of like what you're looking for. Um, so we have a community right now of about 55,000 members and we are continuing to grow. If you haven't checked us out, we would love for you to download us at hashtagopen.com. Membership is completely free. And so we hope to see you in app and swiping because you might just meet other people who are looking to come to fun, kinky and, um, you know, events like this. So Sarah, can you tell us more about Laura and our event for tonight? I certainly can. Hello, everyone. I feel like I'm talking to my the, the head talk now. It's like when I when my voice goes like, oh. Um, so hey everyone, this is Sarah Sloan, and um, I am a part of the hashtag Open team. Um, I'm actually the director of operations and communications, um, and so part of like the part of what I do is I, I help make sure that everything in the app works the way that it needs to work, so that y'all can get your freak on. But the other part of what I do is I get to invite. Um, some really amazing, creative, thoughtful, fun, exciting people to come join us for our conversations. And uh, for those of you who have been around for a little while, um, you know that a lot of times we kind of take a more educational perspective. We have um, presenters who come in on different things. Um, and I wanted to shake it up a little bit and bring in somebody who is not only an educator, um, but um, is a rabble rouser and a creative genius and uh, is um, all 55 shades of gray. Um, <laughs> um, my, my first introduction to Laura's work was um, way, way back in the day in Richmond, Virginia, um, when Laura and her wife came to Richmond, probably like 99 or 2000, um, to do a reading. And it was the first time that I'd ever actually heard um, a writer who knew what the fuck they were talking about about kink and was a talented writer um, read some of their work. And it really inspired me to think outside of like the kind of old schlocky um, getting off kind of erotica that I've been reading and really look for stuff that is written by people who have, who have done this, who, um, who understand that it's not just something that's a fantasy for a lot of us that we can blend fantasy and, and reality and use it to inspire our experiences. So um, also I have to say that Laura is one of my favorite comedy writers. Um, so, um, and to, uh, so Laura, you can find Laura's work all over the place. I'm gonna send you links. I'm gonna be throwing in the chat. Um, Laura's most recent book is called Silk Threads. And this is the older cover, um, but this was written in conjunction with Midori and Cecilia Tan, who are amazing, that's the new cover, um, who are amazing um, authors and educators and writers. And um, my personal favorite, just because it's ridiculously fun, is um, Laura's book, The Killer Wore Leather, um, which uh, basically is, I, I, I will say that it's, it's um, a takeoff, uh, or it's inspired by Bimbos of the Death Sun, which uh, is a Sharon McCrum science fiction book. So that's where you can see that some of us have overlapping layers of geekdom. 
Um, but the killer word leather is a murder mystery set at a leather event. So um, if you if you like to get your geek and your laugh and your leather on all at the same time. Um, so, Laura, you're going to be doing some readings for us. And uh, we're going to have folks who, um, if you have, please feel free to throw comments, reactions into the text chat. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and post them there. We will make sure that when Laura's switching between things that uh, we bring those questions up to ask them. Um, but in the meantime, I hope that you're all uh, going to take this little break from worrying about the world around you and get some uh, much more interesting inspiration uh, for the next hour. So, Laura, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yay! It's Yay. good to see you. Cheers! <laughs> yes, we hope you're all at home grabbing your drinks or whatever and getting comfy and settling in because we are excited for for Laura to jump in and, and do these fun readings. I remember seeing you walk in with, with Richmond and grabbing my wife and saying, the lesbians are here. <laughs> God. Yeah, it was a, it was a dark time for us. You know? <laughs> um, but actually I remember that um, she was reading the uh, Intahala story from, oh, yeah. which is still my favorite story. So y'all are just going to have to go read the entire Marketplace series so that you can figure out what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. But um, mm -hmm. that story is hands down, I think, the, my favorite one from that anthology. So that was from the Academy, yeah. uh, which is uh, book four in the Marketplace series. And the Marketplace series is primarily what I'm known for. It's a uh, kind of fully immersive, real life consensual slave training and selling organization. And uh, in book four, basically I had the convention for them because you, you know, you get a bunch of kinky people together, they're gonna have a convention. Yes, yes. And, and I had decided to invite friends of mine to write stories as though they were being told by someone in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so, and then I worked those stories into the manuscript of the novel. So it's a shared world anthology within the novel. And Karen wrote that, uh, that beautiful story, Inshallah, yeah. about a, uh, a Muslim woman who marries in order to inherit all of her father's properties and responsibility and wealth by buying herself a husband on the marketplace. Yeah. It's an amazing story. It really is, like yeah. I said, hands down one of my favorites. So, anyhow, um, <laughs> now that we've now that we've waxed poetic about your wife's talents, uh, <laughs> I am super curious what you are are going to be reading for us tonight. Well, I tend to, when doing live readings, go for something unpublished or something that was taken out of a previous work. Mm -hmm. um, and when I looked through what I have right now, I have two things I've set aside for you. I have an excerpt from Loaded for Bears, my much rejected erotic paranormal action adventure. Book. Oh my God, I love it. Okay, uh, which is ostensibly my entry into the magical world of modern day monster hunters, which is a very, you know, popular field. Only mine are hedonists because they know that eventually the zombie apocalypse is going to get them all. So they might as well have lots of sex, of course. do drugs, and enjoy life while they have it. And yeah, Loaded for Bears is all about evil gay werebears. <laughs> All going I love it. town for bear week mm -hmm. where they will mm -hmm. fuck, kill, and eat the twinks. Oh the my dance. god. Oh my god. I cannot tell you how many times this book has been rejected. Uh, I feel like I got some really nice notes. I feel like that should be like a Kickstarter. Like let's let's get let's yeah. publish it. Let's talk right? A evil gay werebears and people are like, shut up and take my money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make happy, right? It's going to be. <laughs> so I have that. And I've also set aside the first part of a brand new story set in the marketplace Ooh. with a character that we have not seen since book two. <gasps> 
Oh, oh, I'm, I'm kind of okay. So, so I have questions, oh, and I'm, I'm not a sadist or anything, but pick. Um, let's do the. I know now. I'm gonna have to go back and read the whole. Okay, so let's too. do the. It's gonna be for those of us who haven't read. That's <laughs> exciting. We'll have to like. Let's do the. Let's do the werebears first, because I like. Str I like edging myself, so and so I'd like to actually wait and let you. Um, like I'd like to hold off on that marketplace one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> just anticipate it coming. Yeah. That's yeah. right. <laughs> you know, delayed gratification is a good thing for us sometimes. All right. I'm just going to arrange my windows so I could still okay. see you all while I pull this up. Good. Awesome. Okay. So this would be the prologue that begins, uh, that is at the beginning of the book. A low rumble and the smell of wet summer grass made her stretch and open her eyes. She was outside, warm and curled up on a patch of meadow, trees behind her. The moon shining through the leaves was bright and full, circled by a misty penumbra, pale clouds drifting across the night sky. She could hear crickets and tree frogs, a splash from somewhere across the meadow. There was water over there. She could see darts of silver light as she cocked her head to look around. The rumble came again. And this time it carried a scent with it, a thick, salty musk, vaguely sweet, but with a dark, deep earthiness. Old leaves and new grass gave up sound and crackling as her lover came closer, his huge body steady in the dark. She arched her back, pushing herself up on her arms in a deliberate tease, and he dropped down behind her, nuzzling her embracing her body from all fours, the thick fur covering her. Like a favorite blanket, she thought, warm and scratchy and weighted. The heat of his body against hers made the warm night suddenly leap up into steamy. She rubbed back against him, enticing him to come and kiss her throat, and he did, his teeth sharp, and she cried out in sudden passion. Their writhing became frenzied, and she could feel his cock hard and slick and massive. He huffed, and she understood what he wanted. She pushed her body up on all fours, and he grappled with her, finding purchase from behind. His legs were thickly muscled. His massive weight is intoxicating as the rangy scent of his arousal. She felt the clawing trails of his stripe strokes along her back and hips as he began to thrust into her, spreading her wide and filling her so much it felt like a sweet stabbing of delicious agony. He held her in his gigantic paws, covering her in their rut. She clutched the moist black earth in her fingers and moaned in tune with his deep and bestial growls. His ecstasy ignited her own in the balmy night, and she felt the powerful and deep convulsions of pleasure starting. Rocking back to meet him and take him all, she hit the solid wall of his bulk, and he pressed down even more, matching and mastering her with a gratifying ease. It was all perfection. The night, the intoxicating heat, the sheer weight of him, the blanket of his thick, rough fur, the strength of his body. When he opened his muzzle and sank his teeth into her shoulder, she gasped and shuddered to the delirium of supreme pleasure, his gigantic paws holding her muzzle, paws. She screamed, not knowing whether it was orgasm or terror that tore the sound from her throat. <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> Incredible. like the just the description like the like the details like especially like for somebody like me who has not experienced your work before <laughs> laura like just hearing the level of detail being like i feel like i'm there <laughs> like incredible. oh my god that is that is like it it, it is I don't want to say this in a bad way. It is lurid in all the best ways. Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, I feel like lurid oh, is no. usually a, a bad word, but this is like, just, mm. <laughs> <laughs> So, so. The, the main POV in the story is the woman who's having that dream. Oh, that's a dream. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, we gotta. Yeah, the, the next the next scene with her is her waking up um, and looking at her lover in bed and reflecting about all these things. But that is a much larger section, so I decided to go for just the. Just that, the that, that, that was the piece. That was the piece. What? Um, so I'm curious. Like, what inspired you to write? That is mm -hmm. that that concept is really different from what I, what a lot of us are used to that are familiar. What inspired you to to go in that direct direction of like doing some urban fantasy kind of stuff? Because it's a really hot genre. I mean, frankly, mm -hmm. it's a commercial turn mm -hmm. for me. Uh, I used to read a lot more of it, but then it got very much of a muchness. Mm -hmm. It seemed that every new series was about a young and fit, vaguely biker looking woman who is fighting the darkness, blah, 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 because she's a witch or because she knows witches or something. Mm -hmm. um, and as the books continue, she survives while everyone around her dies. Yeah. And so I never want to write what everyone else is writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always thought that the, if I were putting together, a, you know, an effort to fight the darkness that other people don't believe in, right? Mm -hmm. I would have a team and, and it would be a big team and we would accept that we were going to experience losses continually because, you know, vampires and shit are dangerous yeah. and we will die. And so I wanted an ensemble cast, like I have in the marketplace, mm -hmm. with a small collection of key characters that readers could follow on their adventures with a absolutely genuine anyone could die feel. And I wanted to make it with a edge of comedy that's not so much about making fun of the genre, mm -hmm as it is making fun of the tropes in the genre. Got it. Right. Right, because I've read lots of the books where the, they make wise guy cracks about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, first of all, you're making wise guy cracks about something that's 30 years old. Yeah. Move on. Yeah. Yeah, right, like, <laughs> how original. Ha-ha, uh -huh. yeah. Right. So I had proposed, like, four different books. The second one was going to be I, Incubus, which was about basically a haunted app, a haunted dating app run by an incubus and a succubus. I wish David and Amanda were here right now. Just so hard. <laughs> oh, I know, because this is just like, what? Yeah. Right? So you would swipe right, and the next thing you know, your, your soul would be eaten. No, no to all viewers, <laughs> this is not a feature that we have yet. I know that you want this feature. <laughs> we will eventually get there. Please continue supporting us until we can feature, until we can have like yeah. the swipe right and your soul is eaten. Like we'll, we'll work on that for our next release. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the closest you will get right now is Sarah and I banning <laughs> So that's about as close as you're going to get to a, to, you know, a sexy sucker. Right <laughs> Alan, Alan is, I, I, I was, Alan is here for it, you know, so. What do we do these days? You know, it just, they go out on, Tinder and Grinder and stuff, and they're like, "Well, this is, doesn't work for us. We need our own app." And the next thing you know, they're raking in the that's souls. Fucking amazing! I love that. Oh, have you seen? Great. Wow. Uh, slightly so off funny. topic, but have you seen the the Hulu the show on Hulu about vampires? Um, the newer one. It's two seasons, um, but it's basically these vampires, and they're they have a. Uh, a familiar who's supposed to go find them virgins and he he starts like, oh my god yes. yes like you just thought of it what we do yes i've never seen that oh yeah cat just oh put it god. in the chat it, too it yes amazing okay. i haven't it seen it amazing. yet so first of all the movie is brilliant okay, okay? it's what he did before he became famous for doing thor movies and stuff right but i I have low expectations for the American series version, but oh my God, it's amazing. It is fantastic. When they have guest vampires and they're actually like actors who play vampires, I just fall off the couch in, in sheer when, pleasure. When, when they had Tilda on, I literally almost like just flat up passed out and peed myself. 
like just honestly. Honestly, right? Sorry. <laughs> I oh, yeah, right now, in the afterlife, David Bowie is like, I would have been yeah. on that. Um, I would have done that. that. that says, <laughs> um, Colin Robinson, who is my personal favorite yeah. because I'm also an emotional sadist. So I like telling bad puns and then watching people react. So, yeah. Oh, my God. The episode where he got powerful? Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like, oh, that God is Friday. I'm like... Um, I need to take notes on like reading lists. Oh god, to watch it's lists. So yes, Dean, we can see your message. Yeah. So you are your messages are working. Um, so uh, I don't want to. I don't want to like move us from uh, into a watching the TV because you you had something else that you said you were going to read, and um, I'm a little yeah, uh, I'm a little. Well, I've been working on a bunch of new short stories set in the marketplace. Um, the last novel that I wrote was The Inheritor, um, which was a huge, like, emotional yeah. case. It was the end of a large character arc that went through the entire series that, you know, wound up to this big emotional payoff. And I was like, okay, next I'm doing short stories. Thank you very much. <laughs> how, how many years did The Inheritor take? I uh, about yeah. 10 years. Yeah. It took me a long time to write it. Wow. So short stories after that. Um, right. And I decided that the theme would be Marketplace B characters. Mm -hmm. So these are characters that either had one walk on or they're small mm -hmm. parts in, in different books. And they would all be slaves because then I could use the title Slaves of Marketplace because if your book title has slave in it, it sells better. Interesting. The only thing that makes it sell better is uh, the word cat. So if I could somehow, you know, cats of the marketplace. Cats of the marketplace probably, would be amazing. You know, yeah. Right. But there are no slave cats, so it doesn't work. Slaves to the cats of the marketplace. Hmm. Awkward title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll have to work on that a little more. So um, a long time ago, my wife, and I kind of like split up a bunch of my secondary characters and we each agreed to take X number of them. And she's written a couple stories and uh, I've finished two stories. And wow, not surprisingly, since the first two new pieces of marketplace fiction I've written since the unpleasantness of 2016, they are not um, my typical set up sex scene, wry ending. They're actually both uh, kind of karmically heavy. Okay. And I said, oh, my God, Laura, please, uh, write a funny one. And so, <laughs> so what I have is, is the first couple of pages of the awesome. funny one. Awesome. Because out of context, the serious ones are just like, they're. So let me pull it up. <laughs> this is called, the working title is, Mr. French. And you have to be of a certain age to get the reference. Gay bars ain't all cinder block eyesores with no windows to shine light on the furtive emotional wrecks who toss back far too many bottom shelf shots while nursing a beer during a happy hour that ain't neither. But this one is not at all like the far more expensive cocktail menu, high def giant screens of porno and near porno music videos less than three blocks away. That place got drag nights with local artists, bare chested bartenders with bubble butts and run nights for leather clubs and their softball team, the Wranglers. Men went there to be seen and look at the boys worth looking at. This forsaken hole could have used a makeover to reach the level of dive. No one wants to be seen there unless it's the closet jockeys picking up spare change from the previously alluded to emotional wrecks before they slunk back to their overpriced condos and undervalued spouses of various genders. And into this town tunnel, this safari park of ye old golden days of sad faggotry, stumbles a ridiculously handsome young man, his golden hair wafted and tangling around his head like a spidery halo. No hustler he, despite his cover boy beauty and that certain air of insouciant charm about him. Even the crew who took pity on the emotional wrecks took care to dress and style to appeal. This boy, though, oh no. This handsome lad who turned more than a few heads was a steaming hot mess. 
no one would mistake him for someone wanting to allure some chosen cocksucker into parting ways with folding presidential memorabilia. At first glance, you might be fooled into thinking he belonged amongst that congregation, young, stupidly good looking, but then with a blink, you would be revising. Store brand jeans, not tight enough. Sneakers pricey, but not near on mode. T-shirt was tight, but also stained. Not artfully, not this garment may have marks or inconsistencies in the weave and color because it's super rare and we need you to pay 50 bucks for a goddamn T-shirt, so shut your pie hole and fork it over. No, we're talking spaghetti sauce. Maybe ketchup. Something crusty and pale that was absolutely not old jizz. And clipped to the collar was some kind of hair ornament or perhaps a humiliation device because it kind of looked like a purple butterfly. And you might be forgiven for picturing the plastic purple butterfly as the linchpin in some diabolical scheme exposing this annoyingly pretty butt bandit to the ridicule of the cock-raising sort. One thing that would stop you in your mighty charitable and kind interpretation of his presence would be the waves of despair and frantic woe pouring out of him like hooch from those well-watered bottom shelf bottles. A phone, please, he begged. Please, please. His voice and accent suited to the very best in cowboy porno. Tell me you got a payphone. The three men on the customer side of the bar stared at him. The bartender looked up from his video game and took about 10 years to ask, what? I need to make a phone call, but there aren't any damn phones. I can pay. Would you let me use your phone? His eyes pleading, voice shaking. Your heart would give a twang at this poor thing. And you'd sympathize with the confused bartender because the young man was holding one of them fancy cell phones. The kind all the annoying computer people throughout the rest of Seattle had glued on their hips and asses. Not some cheap ass thing that came free with your plan, but one of them fancy things that was like a computer in your ass pocket. The bartender flicked his eyes up and down, clearly stumped by this puzzling turn of events. It don't work? He finally asked. It, I, the pretty boy tried to talk, but it was a lengthy voyage for thoughts to tongue. It's not mine. I mean, it's my employer's. One of the bar flies grunted. Oh, let him use your phone, Mel. He don't want his fucking dot com listening in. I told you they all do that, right? Chips and everything now. Read our minds next. Grateful, the young man sh nodded his shaggy blonde head and the bartender shrugged, walking at about the pace of the Ice Age to the other end of the bar. The bar flies eagerly began talking about them Microsoft fuckers and them IBM fuckers and them Apple fuckers and what about that fucking internet, huh? Eventually, quivering in desperation, our poor frazzled spaghetti stained cocksucker managed to punch in the number and drummed his long fingers on the worn surface of the bar. When the call connected and he heard the familiar voice, he should have been ready to deliver demands or complaints or declarations with a firm flurry. Instead, burst into tears and slid down to the floor, bumping his head on the bar. Record screech! You might be wondering how I, a lanky, elegant, cosmopolitan Austin butt bandit, complete with a degree in a very respectable first sale in the marketplace, happened to come to this rather disturbing turn of events. Well, I'll tell you. Settle in and pour me a shop from the top shelf kindly and kick off your boots because this ain't going to be a quick chat. Oh my God. I'm, I'm literally sitting here going like, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Was this one of the, the people that was in the class with Robin? He did, in fact, help with Robin's training. It's Leon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I got really excited. Um, uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Marketplace series yet, like, let me just tell you, you need to be. Um, and I think for, for kinky people of a certain age, like when, when I got started going to kink events and, and like, you know, kind of getting my hands on, material and people and, you know, how I was learning, um, you know, like we had, we had like not a whole lot that was out there that was really written by and for um, folks who were doing this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was definitely some stuff that was, um, I'm, I'm, if you see me looking this way, it's because that's where my bookshelf is. Um, but we had, we had not a lot in the way of like educational stuff. But it was also like the marketplace series was really the first thing that that I read that um, 
felt like there was there was elements of what we talked about when we talked about kink. We, there was elements of like consenting to things. There were elements of having an agreed upon structure for for how you would behave, how you would what the etiquette would be. Um, so it's kind of like it took some of the stuff that a lot of us fantasized about and turned it into a world where where it was a reality. Um, and I, I remember the many, many groups, the, the Yahoo groups and, you know, back in the day where of people who were all just huge fans of the marketplace. So, um, yeah, I feel like in terms of, you know, in terms of tapping back into that, um, I'm super excited because to me, it's like those characters are, you know, folks that I was reading early on that I was like finding little bits of myself here and there mm -hmm. in them. Um, and, you know, getting some both one handed reading with and also getting some kinky ideas for like what what I might want to try doing with a partner. Um, so I'm super glad you're diving back into some of those characters. Well, you know, um, the first one came out in 1992. Mm -hmm. OK, and um, again, sort of like what I wanted to do with my paranormal series. I wanted to write something that was not like yeah. the other porn out there. And the first contract that I got from that publisher, I did an anthology of short stories that was all about people doing SM for the first time. And every single story had a different combination of types of characters in terms of gender and orientation. Mm -hmm. Maybe. And so I didn't understand that that was groundbreaking. Yeah. My thought yeah. was, I'm going to make a you know, collection of stories, and it's all about people doing SM for the first time. They're all going to be the, the interlocking theme is that they've all gone to see this really sexy movie. And then on the way home, they're like, we got to try this, or I got to try this. And then they embark on their adventure. Everything from, you know, the committed heterosexual married couple with the kids at home to swingers and lesbians and, and, uh, and gay men and uh, two bisexual men who haven't quite gotten to the point of saying bisexual, but help mm -hmm. a brother out. Nice. Right? <laughs> and, you know, I just for every story was a different setting. And I just, you know, fulfilled the contract, sent it in. And then reviews started coming in. And people was like, this is groundbreaking. I've never seen a book that had all of these sexual orientations represented. All of the stories are positive. All of them feature some form of negotiation or grounded in reality. And I was like, so let me tell you about my idea for a trilogy. Nice. Because what I wanted to do was, I mean, I love John Preston's mm -hmm. book so much, but he only yeah. wrote about gay men. And, and, you know, I loved Patrick Califia's mm -hmm. early work. And at the time, he was mostly yeah. writing about lesbians. Right? And so all of my reading was segregated in some way or another, and therefore deleted some aspect of... Yeah, me. You know, I find all sorts of bodies attractive. I find all sorts of orientations and play attractive. I wanted to write in a world where it looked like what I saw. So when someone actually wrote this article and said, you know, Laura's groundbreaking work at the marketplace introduced the first um, trans man as a uh, as a romantic hero, I was like, "What? Oh, oh, um, that wasn't my intention. I just wanted to make him hot." Wait a minute. So, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so you didn't intend to write Chris. I intended to write him as a trans man, as I knew trans men right. at the time. All right, he is very much a product of what mm -hmm. I knew about trans men in the early 90s. I was fortunate that I had some really yeah. generous friends who were 
very patient in educating me in very creative ways. My education, top notch. Um, and I made him yeah. sexy because they were. I didn't think of it as groundbreaking. I thought of it as reflecting the world I lived in. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I was puzzled when people were like, what is the mystery about this character? It's no mystery. Yeah. It's never a mystery. You, you just didn't know. You didn't know all the sexy guys I knew. Which is sad, but it's a better time now. I don't know that I could write those books now. Mm -hmm. It, it really does come down to like, it's, you know, that it sounds like your art is a product of the time and the place. Yes. And I'm fully supportive of own voices. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm glad. I also think it's really interesting. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, Laura. I'm glad that I, you know, wasn't trying to come up with this now because I wouldn't have gone ahead with it. It's, it's, it's up to the men to write their stories. You know, I, I can't step into your story. At the time, it was like, it's up to me to write this story because ain't no one else writing this yeah. story that I want to read, so I did. Um, and I'm just thinking about even with the idea of, um, I think, you touched on it, Sarah, just the idea of like, you know, books versus movies and, and you know, in, in general, you know, the idea of like getting the full picture in writing of like the really nuanced parts of consent and all the pieces that lead up to a scene that you'll just never see in porn. You'll just see, you, it's just something that, for, especially for somebody exploring and learning, like those are just things they're going to show you the, the right to it parts and versus like when you're exploring and, and you're new to it. Being able to read and explore erotica and really hear, like you said, Sarah, being able to really be like, oh, that's actually what a scene is like. And those are really the negotiation and the nuanced pieces of how to ne negotiate that and the emotions that come along with it. And being able to see the full picture in writing versus just, you know, the so limited version that you'll see in, in visual representations mm -hmm. and porn and, and, and photographs is really so undervalued, I think. And like, we say it all the time in like mainstream movies or something like, oh, the, the, the books are so much better. Well, cause you have the ability to really do yeah. all of those descriptive, amazing um, details that you can't, you can't capture just on screen all the time. Well, there are a lot of people who are kinky, who are now producing mm -hmm. lots of, um, lots and lots of erotica um, of, you know, the usual, uh, spectrum of of quality um and i think it's really funny that every time i do bother to read some of the new stuff i'm like this sounds like you took notes at the class on negotiation and then went home and wrote an assignment it's like <laughs> if you're writing it as fiction honestly you can yeah. curtail some of this stuff and and move directly to the magical point where everything yeah. that happens is great and sometimes i think i want to do a writing class and then i remember how much i hate <laughs> writing classes so yeah there is maybe something not. about having um having a way for people to use erotica and to use smut as ways to tap into fantasies that they may not have language for. Um, oh, I do, I do teach a class on using um, uh, either writing or using existing smut yeah. in order to negotiate. Yeah, it's a great tool. It is a really great tool because a lot of times mm -hmm. we only, you know, like we only negotiate from within our limited perspective. And, you know, talking about, you know, right. your stories mm -hmm. in the marketplace and how it's not right. And I think you were, you were referring to the catalyst when you were first talking about the, yeah. Um, yes. But having those yes, stories be a reflection of all of the different kinds of people that come to the table. You know, most of, most mm -hmm. of what we consume is, is very, it's within a very small realm and it's going to be people who are sort of like us or are sort of fucking the way that we are. And I think there's like the cool thing about yeah. erotica is that it can break our break our um, our barriers open to what it might be like for other people, 
And, and like, we can learn from that. We can be inspired by it. We may decide like, like, you know, at various points in time, I've read something and I was just like, I don't think I'd be interested in that. And I read about it and it gets going in my head. And six months later, I'm like, I'm like hell bent mm -hmm. for leather on it because I just needed to see it in a context mm. that I could identify with. Oh yeah. Um, I read so much porn uh, so early. I, I was, you know, one of those kids who knew I was kinky really early and I consumed so many scholastic books about um, mm -hmm. slavery. <laughs> oh my God. I was that kid at the mm -hmm. scholastic book fair who had to get a box to put books home. Right. And, and, and I still have some copies of some of the ones that were just really seared into my memory into the earliest kind of not so much a sexual attraction, but this deep, abiding recognition. I was like, whatever is happening here, my reaction to it, I don't think other people have that reaction to it, right? And, um, and in porn, it's so easy to kind of fall into feeling like, oh, well, you know, it's porn. That means everyone thinks that way. Or it's porn. Therefore, it's not yeah. real at all. When you try to find your place between those two, is it's a bit tricky. And I read the worst porn, the worst porn, because that's yeah. what was available when I was a teenager. So when I went out to meet kinky people, there was a part of me that knew eventually I would meet the wrong one and they would kill me. Yeah. And yet I went. And I don't want anyone to ever feel that again. I want people to read these books and say, aha, look at this magical, you know, world in the marketplace with, you know, slave trading and stuff. It makes no sense, but wow, the sex scenes are great. And to be able to look on the internet and find that, you know, BDSM has rules and safe and consensual and risk aware consensual kink and everything else and, and not go through this period of, I can only see myself in porn and porn is not a really healthy way to learn about your sexuality. Yeah. I write a lot of right. smut. I tell people, I also watch Star Trek. I can't build a spaceship. You should mm -hmm. not come to me for mm -hmm. relationship advice <laughs> through my fiction. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's also like, <laughs> like, you know, there's, uh, I think sometimes we, we lose the ability to filter. Um, like the, we don't, you know, it's separating the wheat from the chaff in essence. And so there's <laughs> some of it that's like, yeah, that's a really, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody today who's like, I have this fantasy and I'm thinking to myself, that's a, that's a kind of capital F fantasy. Like that's, that involves a, you know, a large group, uh, you know, a group of people that is larger than many cities are allowing to be present right now. Um, and they're, they're like, you know, I'm really curious. I really, I feel like I really want to do this. And I'm like, okay, you know what? That's awesome that you feel like it's really hot for you. Like, you know, maybe, maybe that's a thing to play with the idea of for a little while. And then, you know, like try approaching it in little ways. And because it's, you know, it's when, when the fantasy is there and it's so big, it kind of clouds the judgment a little bit. And so I think sometimes people approach porn as like, oh, that's the thing. And it's kind of like, you know, like our, our hormones get going and our brain cells stop. Um, and, and so <laughs> to, you know, to an extent, it's like, that's one of the reasons why I like reading and consuming work from other people who are doing kinky stuff, because I feel at least there's, when I do that, because um, like good fiction involves a suspension of disbelief. Um, and so like, I want to be able to Absolutely. suspend disbelief and, and feel like I can kind of have some space in there that it's like, oh, okay. It's safe for me to suspend disbelief here because, it, you know, like I know that in the end, there are going to be some, some truths that are going to be part of this. Um, although if it's well-written, oh yeah, some of the truths yeah. are going to be really um, hard. Yeah, when you were talking about like, you know, some of it is heavier, some of the more recent stuff that you've written. Um, I, I wonder, 
have you seen this with other writers that that the tone is has changed over the past little bit um just because of what's going on in the world do you feel like that that's something that's coming through in people's work oh, great question mostly what i see from a lot of the creative people in my circles is a creative block um especially mm -hmm. since 2015 and then 2016 mm -hmm. kind of ramped it up to 11. And yeah. I, I shared something on Facebook uh, today or yesterday about how we're being mean to ourselves because we're not doing our work. We're not creating, we're not focusing. We have all this free time right? Because we're home during pandemics and we can't go out. Why aren't we writing our books and, and making our art and that sort of thing? It's because we are literally living in a state of trauma. And you wake up in the morning and there's an outrage. And by the end of the day, there have been five other outrages. And you want to stay informed and responsible. You want to stay sane. <laughs> and functional, yeah. right? To, to take care of your immediate responsibilities and, and to keep your home life as, as functional as humanly possible. And then you wanna go and write a happy story about right. people relating and their great complicated sexuality. No, it turns out the first mm -hmm. story I wrote brought back the least popular character ever and pretty much is a long scream about how the world is uns un Sharon? fair. Yeah. And it's Sharon, yeah. And then the second story I wrote is an email dialogue between a white man and a black man about slavery and fascism and mind numbing and being part of the system or fading away. And I said, oh, great. People are going to love these stories. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why don't I just kill someone off in the next one? I think that, like, sex is political, you know? And, and like, you know, gender is political and sex is political. And, and, and we don't, you know, we don't have this in a vacuum, right? A couple of years Right. And like we were saying, like with like like that, I think yeah. so many people will really identify with those those experiences right now is that, you know, as fun as it is to escape in the mm -hmm. fun, like lighthearted stories, like I think so many people are going through it right now that they're yeah. going to that's just going to resonate so much with so a many people. years ago. I was at an event and we do we did an AMA, you know, ask me anything and step back when you invite me to do an AMA, because if you ask me anything, I will answer honestly. And one of the questions was, what did I think black people thought about the master slave community and, and that sort of thing? And I said, I don't know, maybe one of you white people should have mm -hmm. asked a few. Yeah. On, on this huge rant I was like you are my people and you are so dysfunctional about this yeah. it, it's insane yeah you know and and only now you're discovering that walking into the fast food restaurant in your master slave patch is a little uncomfortable when everyone dishing out yeah. your fries is black yeah and confronting those uncomfortable realities yep are all coming I'll to never the be <laughs> back there again. Um. I mean, but but like, <laughs> but I came home and I said, obviously, I have to address this within the marketplace yeah. because it's this big unaddressed thing. Yeah, and I wrote the story. I think it's it would be easy to just keep doing the same thing over and over again because I think that's what people get comfortable with, but. That's that's not that's not life. Mm -hmm. And frankly, yes. if that's your sex life, ugh. you know, like if your sex life isn't occasionally going like what more could there be? What else is out there? Then, you know, and mm -hmm. and that requires being a little bit uncomfortable. It requires being a little vulnerable or being a little bit like, oh, I don't know if this is going to work out the way we wanted it to. But 
you know, are, are we willing to give it a shot? Is it worth the risk? Irritation <laughs> makes beauty. Yeah. It's true. You, you, you have to heat things mm -hmm. in order to meld them. You have, there has to be the grain of sand to become the pearl. You have to, you have to poke it. And it's really, really hard right now to yeah. prioritize creative work because there's so much of the great work that needs to be done out there. And there's a part of, you know, the good angel on this shoulder is like the great work is your art, make art. And, and, and the other yeah. good angel is why yeah. aren't you laying down in front of the trucks carrying people to detention yeah. camps, you slacker. <laughs> yeah. And they are both really good angels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and trying to find somewhere in between, yeah. yeah. And still find the energy to create. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, so yeah. I'm trying. You're doing some I'm really, really cool trying. shit. Because, I, I mean, I think what, what you've done is kind of um, something that I have believed since the start it is that, that we're all going to have to figure out a new way and we're all going to have to pivot and we're all going to have to shift yeah. because, because that's what we have to do. And in order, like, you know, it's like when we, when we come to these points where, you know, in a personal life, it's like, oh, okay, like that's not working so well. We don't double down on what's really not working well. We, mm. we find a way to shift it. And, you know, it's like you um, getting, you know, starting to do more activities online and doing readings. Um, for those of you who have not, uh, have not already been on Laura's uh, Facebook page, uh, Laura does some readings from some salacious tell-all political books, including the new Trump book, um, in the afternoons. Um, yeah, I was going to say you were doing John Bolton for, for a bit, and, and now we're doing Mary Trump. Um, yeah, but you can, you can uh, join for that. Um, but it seems like you've been looking for ways to, to kind of create some brightness and to create some space through this with your work. And I think it's been really awesome. Well, we do have the yeah. plague of players, <laughs> which is my volunteer Shakespearean table reading group. And we meet in Zoom and read a play once a month, taking on different roles. And we got a new logo today. And, and uh, my players have said, we need to do Duchess of Malfi. And we're going to do that in September, which I've never even read John Webster before. And oh my <laughs> God, is this shit gory or what? <sighs> and, and then, because I was having so much fun with that, I turned a short story I wrote into a, into a script. And I got my patrons to play the that's roles amazing. of people from the Killer War Leather as they started. Oh, the that's narrative. amazing! Um, so, uh, Laura, by the way, for our, our listeners, uh, Laura has a super active uh, Patreon um, where you can get access to works in progress, and uh, you can ask questions. And um, I think there's one where you can even, when it's not COVID times. If you supported a certain leather, you can be invited to Seder. Um, so, so Laura has lots of ways to support. Um, for those of you who aren't uh, actually seeing the chat, um, the link is to go to patreon.com uh, slash kvetch, K-V-E-T-C-H. Um, and if you can't remember that, don't worry, I got you. All you got to do is, is uh, hit us up and we will be happy to, to pass over all of the links mm -hmm. to Laura's work. Um, we'll also, these will be, those will be in the notes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, um, once it's up, you can actually just scroll your little self right down on that screen and look at the links in the notes. Um, and that way you can, you can find all of Laura's good stuff. Um, and we are kind of coming to the wrap up point. Um, Laura, was there anything else you wanted to, hmm? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, people have been really quiet. And I know that we've had some people watching on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, hi. Um, <laughs> um, um, I think uh, I just want to say thank you, you, first of all, for being, for you being here. Um, and I think this is, we would love to have you back again yeah. sometime. And um, we will we will come up with, with fun things to do with you, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> um, Terrific. Thank you yes, so for, I know. I want to yeah, stay. I think I, I want to stay informed. I think maybe we need to. Piece. We need to. I am just. I think that is just like 
what I think we're a match <laughs> made in heaven. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we would love to stay informed on yeah. on, on your work and, and what you're up to. And, and, you know, for those of you who are watching and haven't explored Laura's work like myself and, and uh, get into it, let us know on social media what which ones you, you're checking out and what you're loving. And I if you want a recommendation, on, just tell me what your know general what jam my is are. in terms of what kind of what kind of energy you're looking for. And I will I will start you chapter and verse in the right place. I promise. I am really good. I love I love matching people up with other people, and I love connecting <laughs> people with yeah. the right book or the right article. So let me do this for you. It is my service. Um, so um, you can find us again at hashtag open.com. Uh, real quick, just wanted to let y'all know what's coming up in the next this many weeks. Um, next week we're going to take a little dive into the leather stuff, and on. Tuesday, um, Issa Arden, who is one of our yeah. Chicago leather women and um, very active as a leather historian and an art historian, um, Laura, uh, Issa and I are going to be on. We're going to talk a little bit about the leather community. And then on Wednesday, we are having our next members only movie night. Um, so if you're a hashtag open member, um, all you have to do is look at your yeah. app notification on Tuesday and we will be sending you the link and you can join us for a private screening of the documentary Kink Crusaders, um, which was filmed at 2008 International Mr. Leather. So you can kind of see a little bit about what all that's about, right? We, we're going to blast from the past, blast from the past. <laughs> and, and then read Killer World Leather. Um, and then uh, the last week of this month, we have there you go. Chase and Goddess <laughs> Erica who are two amazing uh, feminine dominants that are both based in Chicago. And they're gonna be actually talking about uh, the art and, and tease of feminine dominance and how that can be super empowering. So if you're curious about uh, exerting your dominance or how dominance can be expressed in a more feminine way, definitely check us out for that as usual. All of those are absolutely free. Um, please follow our social media, check us out on Facebook. Um, you can view us on FetLife. You'll find links to everything. Um, this video will be up within the next couple of days on YouTube, as well as on Instagram. So you can come back and re-listen to Laura's, uh, Laura's stories. And um, please go visit Laura's website and buy some books and make sure that we can keep Laura in the style to which we believe that she should become accustomed. <laughs> 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 I need some teeth. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, in in a in a better world, all artists would be supported without without stress. But we are not in that world, so we need to support our people who create amazing shit for us because we need you in order to survive this law. Right. So, um, so let us take care. absolutely. Absolutely. And I hope everybody has a wonderful Leave evening. that creative energy. And um, thank you again from the Hashtag Open team. Bye. And thank you. <laughs>